A warm welcome to everybody here. Uh, for anybody who's chaired a high-powered panel like that of tonight, I can assure you there's nothing more terrifying coming to a hall, which is absolutely packed, and another perhaps uh, 200 people queuing up. But it's also extremely rewarding uh, to see such interest in uh, such pertinent matters as they affect not only our region, the Middle East, but also, of course, uh, the world at large. And your presence tonight is a testament to that. I know you're here to <coughs> listen to our speakers, so I'll make my <coughs> introduction very, very short. Uh, but I just want to start by a rather abstract uh, observation that had a Martian visited Earth uh, sometime in July, August, uh, he or she, and I have to be very careful about my choice of gender here, uh, would have been excused to be really feeling very confused. One part of Mother Earth pulling for uh, autonomy and away from a union, another part of Mother Earth for uh, creating a larger union. I'm not going to push uh, this analogy too far, don't worry, especially if you are Scots, but <laughs> happily that's as far as the analogy goes. Uh, one uh, event, tumultuous event, uh, decidedly uh, determined. We know the outcome, at least for now. The methods much, much more uh, peaceful and civil. Another one, sadly, uh, as Kabir said, uh, well, I hesitate to choose the words, but uh, really uh, brutal and uh, ruthless. Now, this is a very apt moment to convene a high-powered uh, academic panel to discuss issues relating to IS, 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 IS or ISIL, uh, because, not least because as we speak, the UK Parliament is debating another uh, motion whether to go to war uh, in the Middle East or not. On some counts, this is the third time, uh, you know, an Iraq war uh, is unfolding. And there's very little doubt that uh, the result of that vote, which either has come out any time now or will be as this panel uh, continues, uh, is as predicted, which means uh, I bet, and I stand to lose uh, my credibility, tomorrow morning when you wake up, you will hear news of six uh, uh, tornado crafts which have taken off from Cyprus and have started bombarding parts of Iraq. You've heard this before? Well, uh, it's almost, in some respect, a uh, rewind of history going back over the last 20 years. But it looks like this time uh, some lessons have been learned. We are told the cabinet uh, was fully briefed and was unanimous in its decision to put this uh, motion to the Parliament, and we are reassured that this time the Attorney General has provided the unambiguous legal advice that this is going to be a legal war. So no worries there, huh? <laughs> okay, well after that uh, short introduction, uh, I have the pleasant and easy task of introducing uh, our speakers and overseeing the discussions tonight. As I said, I take heart in seeing so much lively interest uh, in the Middle East at SOAS with my London Middle East Institute hat. Uh, this is uh, something that SOAS excels in, and you will see in the month and weeks to come a whole range of activities and events, some of which uh, for a better, happier subject, uh, including cultural events, concerts, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it will be our pleasure to see such large numbers, particularly our new students. Of course, our returning students, those who already have been at SOAS and who are continuing, also have our welcome. But those of you who are in SOAS for the first time, well, welcome to a different world. Here we take area studies very seriously. It's in our bones. It's in our genes. We don't apologize for combining our academic discipline uh, with specialization in some part of the world, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And we are quite active on those fronts. Um, so for some more down-to-earth matters, uh, as you can see, this is a 
packed hall. I ask everybody to make sure uh, you're not obstructing uh, exit route. We're not expecting a fire, but I have to point out that there are two fire exits, uh, one in each direction. This is, a, I can assure you, this is a fairly standard announcement, but we do take health and safety matters seriously as well. Um, my aim is to proceed according to the sequence uh, already mentioned in the program, and uh, each speaker will be given 15 minutes max to speak. Uh, and I will try and stick to the time by several friendly gestures at first to remind <laughs> of time. And I don't rule out other measures either. But I don't expect uh, a serious aberration from timekeeping because uh, this is something we are quite good at here. And our speakers are seasoned speakers. Um, at the end, we should have hopefully a sufficient time for questions from the floor and I will proceed in batches of three. I'll do my best to accommodate as many questions as possible, but I want to record my uh, apology in advance if I can't uh, accommodate everybody. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to ask our first speaker, Mr. Qiyas al-Jundi, to speak. He's a Syrian writer and human rights activist who's been living in London for the past 15 years. Bias has worked as a freelance journalist and has written for several Arabic newspapers, including Al Safir in Beirut. He took part in the Right to Life project, a creative writing program for torture victims and survivors. He writes poetry and short stories and has written a play that was performed in London. He has been working for, on freedom of expression campaigns in the MENA region since 2001. Please join me in welcoming Bias. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for coming, and uh, it's very nice to see all of you. Even it's very terrifying to <laughs> to speak to this big number of students. Uh, uh, I decided to speak really not to prepare anything to be spontaneous uh, because I, I prefer discussion more than speaking. Um, so I will speak about three issues, and I'm sorry if I jump from one point to another point, and you see the. You can guess how difficult it is sometimes. Um, the idea of ISIS, I, it was very expected, like from the, from the day one of the, the Syrian revolution, it, but it was called last time, at that time, the Syrian revolution, that the, the Islamists will jump into the middle of the arena and take over as they did in other countries, Egypt and Tunisia and later Libya. Uh, Syria had a special case, as you, most of you maybe know. Um, the level of brutality of the regime and also the chaos the American invasion left in Iraq uh, in 2003, uh, there was a vacuum in, in, in the whole sub-region. And I myself expected um, um, that that will happen, that the ISIS or some Al-Qaeda branches will, will start uh, operating. But also, I was also na naive enough not to, not to think it will go that far, because I thought the Assad regime will fall um, before we get into this stage. I was just a, a dreamer, like many other Syrians who suffered under the uh, Assad regimes, uh, two Assads, as father and the son. Um, so this is, there was a seed in the area that it will, a bad seed, of course, it will grow and grow and grow. And uh, the regime was very interested in, in seeing this, what's happening today, because he wanted to see uh, people comparing between, oh, Shall I go with ISIS or, or with, with Assad? No, no, Assad is less brutal and I support Assad and it's what's happening now on the ground in, in, in Syria. Also, Syria has very, uh, like, I mean, worse than Iraq because we have in Syria more sects, unfortunately, more Islamic sects. In Iraq, they have two 
main sects, while in Syria we have four or five or whatever. And also, that helped badly to um, the idea of polarization, how the Sunni Muslims will be described as a terrorist by the regime and by the many of the me Arab media as well, like in, for example in Tunisia or other Arab countries and by the, um, some of the Western newspapers as well. So this, this is the general idea about the vacuum was already there in, in, in the country. Um, the, 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 the grouping of, of, of the Islamist, the, the early grouping of the Islamist and the, the early interference of the, of the regional power or regional countries, I can't call, call all of them power, like Qatar, which I will mention later, um, it changed really the, 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 the course of the Syrian revolution from peaceful, beautiful demonstrations where everybody enjoyed, loved, and you see the dancing, the songs on the streets, to an early chanting about Islamic State and stuff. So this, is, this is, didn't take long to, to, to start where I remember the first beautiful demonstration in Damascus, in Mazza, where it is the heart of Damascus, where chanting about our leader forever is Muhammad. And this was um, an early sign of where, where the revolution was going to. And as I said, the regime was interested in, in, in doing that and the regional power. So we, we have some few months of happiness, of hope, of the joy of like, at last we will get rid of Assad and his close circle of corrupt and um, perpetrators. Um, the, the use of, of, of excessive power by the regime pushed people, as I said early, to, to establish themselves as a counter power to, to the regime. Uh, the more he killed, the more people became extreme. And here we had, after I mean, maybe in August or September 2011, we had an open stage in Syria. Really, like the uh, foreigners started coming in and local Syrians started getting interested in the Islamization of, of, the, of the revolution. And this is, what, this is the first start of the ISIS. It wasn't ISIS. I mean, in, in this period, we have something called Al Nusra Front, or Jabhat Al Nusra, which is a sister of, of the ISIS, but it, it didn't grow that, 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 that big. Um, Al Nusra Front started recruiting. Uh, there was, sorry, I missed something. The, def the defectors, people from the army, soldiers and army officers, defected from the army and created something called the FSA, or the Free Syrian Army where they had, didn't have any support, they didn't have any training, any arms, they've been depending on the, on the arms confiscated by the, um, when they attacked Syrian units, or for your information, I'm sure many of you know, the, the arms the, re, the Syrian regime gave them. And this is confirmed that, uh, and proved that the Syrian regime in the early stage of the armed armed conflict, the Syrian regime gave the FSA and other groups arms. As I said, the regime was very interested in, in showing the, the, the word, this is a Wahhabi, Salafist, whatever, terrorist groups and not people, people not coming here to fight for freedom or liberty or human rights. Um, in this stage, the guys from Iraq started crossing, the one who were really fighting the Americans or later fighting the Shia or the Shia fighting them. And um, all borders opened, Turkish borders opened, and all these foreign fighters started coming in, getting into the country. One important thing which I wrote about and I interviewed people about, in that stage, Assad regime 
released all Islamists who were detained for years in, in, in the Syrian prison. We have, for example, Zahran al who is now a leader of a division, Islamist division in the al ghuta al-Sharqiyah, or the eastern Ghouta of kind of suburb of Damascus. Uh, there was a case of uh, Al Qaeda returned from from Afghanistan. The American handed him back to Syria. It's called Mustafa Sut Maryam, who I personally, when I worked for Amnesty International, worked on his case because the CIA returned him to Syria for torture and extracting information. In April 2011, he was released, and now he's a big leader of Ahrar Sham. This is another, sorry, another Islamist group. So all this, this. Um, uh, factors helped to reach to the ISIS, where ISIS is now. Um, in, this, in this time as well, big factors, big players, let's say, uh, jumped in, including Saudi Arabia and Qatar. I'm sorry, Qatar is not a big player, but they have a lot of money, so they became a big player for the destruction. The Muslim Brotherhood in Syria created militia or supported militia and called for the Islamization of, of the revolution. Uh, Turkish, Turkish role in, the, in, in this mess we have, it's terrible. We have activists who spotted planes coming into, into Antakya or Antalya the airport and they crossed to Syria freely. The arms came through Turkey and of course the media started playing as well the, the bad role. Um, um, most of my work is on defending freedom of press and media, but when I was watching Al Jazeera reports on Syria, I was terrified and I was just asking myself, is that a really a media agency or a, a I don't know, terror unit or calling for the Islamization, calling for, I mean, I, I mentioned um, an incident I was listening to Al Jazeera and they were interviewing somebody in Homs, where Homs started to be the, the main point of, of this armed conflict and they were asking somebody, are you aware from the army? And the, the correspondent said, no, 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 have you attacked them? No, we haven't yet. Why don't you attack them? And, and he said, um, we haven't found a plan, and, I, and the, the presenter, and I recall it precisely, uh, we heard that the eastern side of the unit is, is open. And I was like, <laughs> absolutely terrified of, of a news or a media agency just directing somebody how to attack the army. So all, all, all the factors, and then of course, Two days later, I appeared on Al Jazeera. They called me, do you want to talk? Yeah, yeah, I went on Al Jazeera Arabic. And they said, what do you think is happening with this um, uh, in Syria? And I, I mentioned that there are a lot of outside players jumping into what's happening. And the presenter, called Muhammad Christian, I still remember his name. He said, such as, and I said, Qatar. <laughs> and the screen went, shh. I went back, went back, and he said, Mr. Al Jundi, can you hear us? Mr. Al Jundi, are you with us? Um, and because I was hearing him, uh, I'm really sorry that the connection between London, our office in London. <laughs> so, with this media, I mean, there's, it was not possible to see a me one media outlet working as a media agency in the region regarding the Syrian situation or, or the Egypt or any other, every media agency was planning, was behind a power. The Al Arabiya did the same, following the Saudi Arabian, Al Jazeera following Qatar, we have the Orient TV, uh, uh, belonged to a Syrian opponent who had problem with Assad family and pushing from the other side for the Islamization. For, um, and. By, by this time, all this chaos I'm talking about, I don't know if I'm making sense or not, but uh, the ISIS started emerging properly, organizing themselves because they have the money, they have the, the extreme um, uh, presentation, and they have the arms. So people 
in Syria, uh, let's speak about the locals, having barrel explosive, I mean, the regime sends aircraft and dropping barrels on the, on the, on the civilians, uh, uh, firing uh, scud rockets to, from Syria to Raqqa, and then in that stage, the Syrian regime left Raqqa city. And he left Raqqa city without any fighting, or very light fighting there. So the city was completely evacuated from the army, except from the outskirts. And at this time, the, the, the ISIS crossed, because they were more organized in Iraq, they've been operating for, for years. They crossed to the to, to Raqqa city with other groups, Ahrar al-Sham and little spots of, small spots of the FSA. And they started grouping themselves, getting arms from, from Iraq, from Turkey through Bukamal and Tal Abyad, and uh, became really organized and they declared their state. Before they, before they occupied Mosul, they declared an Imara or Emirate in Islamic Emirate in Raqqa city. And, uh, depending on the brutality to scare people, but also they were like addressing uh, these people who, who are suffering and who are poor as well. So a lot of Syrians joined them, and they are still joining them. The, the, the decisive moment was when al-Maliki, of the former prime minister of, of, of Iraq, um, evacuated the Mosul. Uh, I was listening to when they came and occupied al-Mosul without any fighting. The Iraqi army, relatively well trained more than the, the ISIS, and they have planes and rockets and stuff. So two or three hours, the, the army leader in, in al-Mosul went to Kurdistan, to Erbil, and made a press statement. I don't know if you've seen it. The, he said, before the, the ISIS came to, to al-Mosul, we, we, we were ordered to leave everything. and leave the, the, our military units. So the ISIS came and confiscated everything, ter terrorized people, and they moved. They moved the, the, most of the heavy arms from Mosul to Raqqa. I don't know how many, like 300 kilometers, I was saying. I was watching actually this morning the rockets and tanks like for 300 kilometers. One helicopter could have destroyed everything. Um, I don't want to go into the conspiracy theory, but I have a full belief that Assad from Syria and al-Maliki in Iraq planned. They didn't create ISIS. ISIS is a seed was there in Iraq and Syria as well, but they facilitated it, facilitated the, 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 the expansion. They didn't stop them. They could have stopped them. The, the headquarters of ISIS in, in Raqqa city never been hit ever by, by the by the Syrian regime. The Syrian regime been hitting Raqqa city for the last 20 days on spots where they F either the FSA out of Raqqa or some groups and the civilians. And this is well documented, but they have a headquarter, the town hall of Raqqa city. He never hit them. He, he never, they never been attacked. They never been uh, stopped. I was interviewing journalists who I really strongly trust when they crossed to occupy Bokamal and he was documenting the, the, the movement of both the army, uh, the, the regime's army and the ISIS. They, they crossed one kilometer from the army unit and no shooting at them, no fighting, nothing. And they were like, they have like four wheel uh, vehicles. They could have been stopped. They could have, um, the Atapka um, air, uh, Port, airport was, was still functioning, so the one aircraft could have been hitting them. Um, so this is uh, the, the situation, the, the chaos situation, and I think um, this is the ISIS and Nusra Front and relatively the FSA played very, very, very destructive role to the Syrian course. Um, I mean, they, as a Syrian, we say they killed the, the, the dream of, of change. Uh, we want Assad to go, we want civil society, civil, society, civil uh, state, and we have now fighting for uh, Islamic State, and we want the Sharia law, and the brutality took place by the ISIS. It's, it's, uh, it's destroyed the whole, the whole dream, and it's also made people side 
with a regime, like say, oh, the regime is secular, which is a, one of the biggest lie in the Syrian context. The Syrian regime is not secular at all. The regime built more mosques than, I mean, 1,800 18, 18, mosques built under the regime. And he supported the, the extremism from, from day one. And he played with the Muslim Brotherhood, fighting. And so this is, this is um, we have a proper civil war now. We have, we have um, there's no hope. There's no hope for an immediate uh, solution. There is no hope. I mean, the Sunni community, I mean, I'm not saying the Sunni, the, the normal people, the Sunni fighters, are going towards the extreme because they have been uh, fe feeling that they were left out, let down by the West and by other people. Uh, and we have the other extremes uh, from the, the regime forces, the Shia extremes who came from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, the Houthis, and, and Iraq. They are fighting with the regime under the context of we are protecting the uh, maqams or the shrines of them. Um, of the Shia Shia uh, sect, so we you have these two extremes: Shia Sunni fighting, Saudis supporting some of them, Qatar supporting the most extreme of Al Nasra, Iran supporting the regime and the Shia, and finally the biggest victim victim are the civilians, our families who are stuck in between. They don't believe in both sides. And they are the victims. And um, now the Americans are hitting the the, the uh, ISIS. I don't see myself that there is a solution for that because I can't see the Americans having a, uh, a clear strategy. So they will hit them, destroy some, and they regroup and have more sympathizers. For me, one point there is if they hit the ISIS and they don't finish off at, Assad, the ISIS will come back stronger. If you want to hit the terror in Syria, they have to hit Assad. But I don't call for the military hitting because this is a different story. But the Americans kicked the Syrian army from Lebanon in five days. I'm sure they have the full capacity to do that in Damascus. And the main perpetrator and the main destroyer in Syria is Assad regime. And because he is there, we have this chaos. Thank you. Next speaker is Charles Tripp, a professor of politics with reference to the Middle East here in Soas. is uh, well known, both of course within the school and at large. Uh, he's an active member of the London Middle East Institute, I'm pleased to say. And he's also a fellow of the British Academy. His research interests include the nature of autocracy, state and resistance in the Middle East, the politics of Islamic identity and the relationship between art and power. Uh, his most recent book uh, is The Power and the People, Path of Resistance in the Middle East, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2003. He's currently working on a project on the emergence of the public and the rethinking of uh, Republican ideals across the states of North Africa. Charles. Hassan, thank you very much, and uh, yes, thank you very much for your very heartfelt analysis. Mine uh, will be looking at the Iraqi side of the equation, and uh, the reason I called the uh, intervention the Rantier Caliphate is for a number of reasons, but just to um, remind people what I mean by uh, the Rantier Caliphate, the, the notion is taken from the notion of the Rantier State, and the Rantier State is really a state where uh, the economy is uh, dominated by external revenues and uh, economic activity is largely geared to distributing and consuming those revenues. So it's also a state where the overwhelming proportion of the state budget relies on revenues, that is rent, derived from external sources, not from domestic taxation. And the reason I use that as a label just to highlight uh, some of the things I'm going to say is when speaking about the Islamic State, ISIL, or Daesh, uh, however one wants to put it, 
Um, I want to do a number of things. I hope I'll try and touch on them uh, this evening in, in the brief time I have. The one is to use, if you like, a perspective of political economy as an antidote or a qualifier uh, to the sectarian uh, ideological terms by which both ISIL has defined itself and, of course, by which people write about it. So I have uh, 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 an instinctive critical view of taking people on their own terms, uh, and so I want to try and look beneath that somewhat. The second reason is to give some sense of the context from which ISIL emerged, as uh, Riaz has done very eloquently in the case of Syria. I want to look at the Iraqi context out of which this peculiar organization arrived, and in doing so, to say that actually it's not so peculiar after all. It simply reflects many existing power systems, not only in Iraq, but also within the region itself. I also want to try and give some idea of the driving dynamics behind it, and finally, some notion of its vulnerabilities uh, as a creature of the political economy. I'm going to try and do all that in 15 minutes, but uh, I won't try to go into too much detail, but, but, uh, because we can obviously have questions and discussions afterwards. So if one looks at the first part first, that is the context, the context in Iraq out of which uh, this organization uh, arrived. And it's really looking at how power in Iraq was distributed and used after 2003, the occupation, uh, the invasion and occupation of Iraq, was particularly under the premiership of Nouri al-Maliki, uh, the man who reluctantly was urged out of office uh, quite recently. And effectively, the pattern of governance, particularly after Nouri al-Maliki's uh, um, prime ministership that was reconfirmed after the 2010 elections, was really a very authoritarian government relying on oil revenues, combined with what my colleague Sami Zabeda has called oppressive communalism. Uh, and by oppressive communalism, what he means, and I would certainly agree with it, and it's certainly been a feature of the landscape in Iraq, is that uh, small groups of people claim leadership and therefore resources in the name of community identity, whatever that community happens to be. Uh, against those who are being deliberately excluded. And then they redistribute those resources, which should rightfully belong to everyone, to a selected few and call it a favor. So in a sense, it's the redistribution of reward in the name of communal identities, which of course therefore uh, fixes it in one way or another. So that was one feature of Maliki's governance. The other was of course, which is the other side of the coin, uh, violence and repression against those who are excluded, naturally, who resent this arrangement, but also violence against those within who uh, have questioned the means and the lines of distribution itself. Iraq is one of the most dangerous places to be a critical journalist or broadcaster uh, from uh, over the last few years, and often from the government forces as much as from anyone else. And of course, the third feature and the context uh, was that uh, this government that was created to some extent as a result of foreign intervention had huge amounts of foreign support. Um, very few questions were asked about governance itself. Uh, as long as the oil flowed, as long as it could portray itself as a champion of free enterprise, which was one of the themes, uh, it could present itself as an emerging democracy. Look, we've had elections 2005, 2010, 2014, as a transitional regime or as a strategic ally. Uh, and that applied as much to Iran as it did to the Western powers. So in a sense, there was a license to operate uh, in that way. So in many senses, therefore, if you look at that context of power, of unequal power, and the resentment it builds up. One has to look at the emerging political economy of resistance uh, in Iraq, particularly amongst the non-Shia Iraqis, both Arab and Kurdish, who, for one reason or other, or not to the same degree, were excluded from the magic circle of Maliki's uh, followers. People naturally fell back on their own resources, networks of self-help, at the best reading of it, but also networks of rent-seeking uh, on a smaller scale operating networks of smuggling, uh, of protection rackets, of kidnapping uh, in one form or another. And for some, of course, crime was no longer a crime since the powerful seemed to be immune from the law. So in a state like that, uh, what is a crime? And for that reason, many things that might have been regarded as criminal elsewhere or at other times in Iraqi history were not regarded as criminal. <clears throat> and with that, of course, goes a, a close attention being paid uh, to the identity of who's being excluded and who's included. Are they one of us? 
So identity is both being reinforced and fixed uh, along lines of reward and punishment uh, by the regime, but it's also being uh, fixed by lines of reward and punishment by those who resist the regime. There is a grid, if you like, of reward and violence, which became a feature of the resistance too. And, of course, a search for external rents and resources from those who sympathized outside the country itself. And although there's been much talk in the last uh, six months or less of the disappearance of the boundaries of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, I can tell you, if you wandered around much of Iraq before that, Sykes-Picot didn't have much meaning on the Iranian border, uh, the Arabi Saudi Arabian border, the Syrian border, and uh, the Turkish border. This is, in a sense, what one has to think of is not what attachment people had to these borders, but what attachment they had to the networks that uh, crossed those borders long before the recent event. So out of this context of uh, uh, a regime characterizing the way I've done it, and I suppose the resistance characterizing the way I've done it, one has to think of the emergence of uh, ISIS, the Islamic State, or the Caliphate, which I would regard as a logical, although not a necessary, outcome of this process. One might argue that it is a symptom of Iraq's disorder, just as its opportunism in Syria is a symptom of Syria's disorder. So one characterizes it as visibly ferocious, well, using violence to establish new claims, as all new claimants tend to overstate the case and have to impress uh, the other players in the game that they are to be taken seriously. Better organized financially, certainly, and in managing uh, the acquisition of the goods that they want to distribute. So, in a sense, it was very effective at both acquiring but also distributing uh, the rents and has been. A political economy of violence, which, of course, follows the same lines exactly. And, of course, in doing so, bringing clusters of uh, associations and groupings together who are also disgruntled with the power at the center of Iraq for the same reasons. Kin, clan, uh, ideologues, Islamists, Ba'athists, many, in other words, operating within the same frame, but not necessarily as systematically. Some of these were ideologically aligned with uh, those who lead uh, uh, the Islamic State organization. Uh, others, however, have made small adjustment, paid lip service, but this isn't a strange idiom. This is something that, in a sense, many peoples in Iraq have had to do for the last 30 or 40 years. You pay lip service to the Ba'ath, and you get the rewards of the Ba'ath. You pay lip service to ISIS, and you get the rewards of ISIS. So as long as the rewards keep fly flowing in such a rent-based system, uh, then there's a reason for following them. And so in a sense, therefore, you look at the patterns of dependency of the Islamic State, uh, and they are firmly anchored in the flow of external rents, and goods and weapons to keep the system serviced, uh, in the reward system uh, of inclusion, in the penalties for exclusion, and also the belief amongst many within the areas they control that they're better than any alternative that happens to be going at the time. So in a sense, there's also a, a comparison going on. And one can look at that, and I won't go into it in, in great detail, but one can look at it in a number of ways. The rents that, uh, in a sense, uh, are illustrated quite well in the diagram or the map uh, on the board. You think about uh, Islamic State and the oil revenues. Um, it's estimated that the oil assets that it's managed to sell uh, in, uh, in the latest estimate was in August of this year, earn it something like $2 million uh, a day. Uh, these are largely smuggled out in trucks uh, through Turkey, across the desert to Jordan. It's been smuggled out across the Kurdish region of Iraq, and it's been sold to the Assad regime uh, in Syria uh, as well. So in, in Syria, uh, the impression is that they control something like 60% of Syria's oil assets, which, because it's a lower production, there have been problems of one form or another, produce about 50,000 barrels per day. In Iraq, they don't control the major oil fields of Iraq. They control uh, smaller ones in the north and west, but generally thought to be uh, producing about 40,000 barrels of oil a day. Selling for, it's estimated, between about $25 a barrel and $60 a barrel, which is a good deal less than the, <laughs> the North Sea Brent, but I don't think they mark their um, Brent crude. I don't think they mark their, their price by that. That, in a sense, is the price you pay if you're smuggling it out in the ways you are. So you can see a very considerable rent from oil sales. There are other ways in which revenues have been uh, earned, again, largely through external uh, uh, means. Reckoned, but again, very difficult and very fluid, to be about between five and 15 million uh, dollars a month. Some of this is through uh, the initial 
uh, uh, financial aid that uh, Reith men uh, Reith mentioned from uh, Guthrie, from Kuwaiti, from Saudi financial aid. In some senses, that came from the private sector, but certainly in the early years, it was tolerated and even encouraged from the official sector, uh, but rather, uh, if you like, casual in terms of accounting procedures. So uh, the money uh, disappeared elsewhere. And I guess two symptoms of perhaps some regrets in Saudi Arabia and in Kuwait is that, of course, recently Prince uh, Bandar bin Sultan, who's head of Saudi intelligence until this year, was dismissed because, again, he had been somewhat uh, cavalier in his notion of who should behave, and they were trying to signal a change in tune. And equally, in Kuwait, uh, the uh, Justice and Islamic Affairs Minister, Naif al-Ajmi, uh, was again, he resigned, was actually dismissed in May of this year, again to signal a change of heart by the Kuwaiti government. So there was that kind of cash. There was cash from the territory that it controlled, looting of banks, military installations, intimidation, kidnapping, human trafficking, and of course, in the Syrian case, and possibly also in the Iraqi case, antiquities smuggling, which I think a report in The Guardian estimated that in, from one small area of Syria earned them something like $40 million, uh, what are called blood antiquities, on the analogy with blood diamonds from Africa's uh, conflicts. And of course, there's the $200 or so going rate levied on every truck that crosses the border and crosses their territory. So you have that sense of uh, an organization depending hugely on these external rents, which it then distributes. And I suppose one could argue, to complete the pattern or the image of the, uh, the rentier state and the rentier caliphate, uh, equally the question of the, uh, the foreign recruits, the foreign labor, if you like, which is very characteristic of the rentier state in other parts of the region, uh, which has been part of this as well. As, again, he has mentioned, Turkey for four years or uh, kept its border, 500-mile border, open with Syria. Uh, and therefore, it became a, a key area where people could go through in, in one form or another. And of course, foreign fighters joining the organization have a symbolic value. They are, in a sense, presentational. It's like Jihad Sans Frontières. It's a kind of a, a notion of, uh, a, of a universal claim being uh, physically uh, realized. But of course, they do two other things which are quite important. One is they bring skills. Uh, IT skills, technical management systems, quite similar, in other words, to the expatriate uh, populations of the Gulf states and elsewhere on a professional level. And, of course, there are the poor old unskilled who uh, often are used as cannon fodder uh, in one way or another. But the other point about the foreign labor is that they lack significant local ties. So, in a sense, therefore, they are more wholly dependent on the leadership of ISIS than anyone else. They are wholly dependent uh, for their livelihood, for their life, and they have very little sentimentality when it comes to the local populations in one form or other. So if that's the picture of the, the Rantier Caliphate, what are the weaknesses? Well, there are three, I suppose, which one has to think about. One is, and to which extent it has a lot in common with other Rantier states, and one thinks of Iraq uh, at various moments as well. The first, of course, is the threat of the interruption of the oil uh, and the flow of rents uh, to the center. So the question is, Recently, Turkey and others trying to close the border. Turkey, to its great surprise, discovering that oil didn't just go out in, in trucks, but went out in pipelines. Oh my goodness, they said. Uh, we never noticed those being built. And this is a very strange uh, road. Anyway, they found plenty of uh, oil depots. They found plenty of oil pipelines. They found uh, plenty of routes across. So there is, and of course, the recent bombardment of the uh, oil fields in Syria. Uh, is part of that endeavor as well. So there is a vulnerability there to uh, the cessation of the flow of rent. The other weakness and vulnerability, which is quite interesting about ISIS and makes it different from Al-Qaeda, is this ambition to control territory. Territory is both the source of wealth, but also the physical manifestation of something that they are trying to plant in the region. And it's a natural accompaniment to the search for rents. Uh, but of course, it means that Physical infrastructure is vulnerable to attack, and also it means you've got to, there are the costs of maintaining the state, of servicing a patronage system of that kind. So again, the question is, what kind of response within the population? And that brings me to the third vulnerability, finally, which is the durability of the cement that keeps the non-ideologically committed uh, on side with the uh, ISIS organization. <sighs> That has to depend on a number of things. It had to depend upon the competence uh, or the continuing belief in the competence of the leadership of the organization, uh, the continuing disbelief uh, in the possibility of a better alternative patronage network with which to attach yourself, and, of course, its vulnerability 
to the succession of defeats that may come with the degradation of the rent sources. So when one looks at those sorts of vulnerabilities, when you look at that kind of political economy of the state, you have to think, and I'm not going to go into this now, we we'll talk about it in the questions, uh, about whether any of the measures being debated probably even now in Parliament or elsewhere, how do they intersect with that? Do they effectively uh, begin to find those vulnerabilities or actually do they paper some of them over and reinforce it in one way or another? Uh, our next speaker is uh, Nadia Al-Ali, who is also a professor of gender studies at SOAS and also another active member of our institute, the London Middle East Institute. She's also a member of the um, magazine uh, we publish uh, bi-monthly called the Middle East in London magazine. She's published widely on women and gender in the Middle East, as well as transnational migration and diaspora mobilization. Uh, Nadia's most recent book was co-edited with Deborah and Najjar uh, and is entitled We Are Iraqis, Aesthetics and Politics in a Time of War. Uh, this was published by Syracuse University Press. Uh, Nadia is a member of the Feminist Review Collective and a founding member of Act Together, Women's Action for Iraq. Nadia, over to you. Thank you, Hassan. I'm supposed to switch this on. It's on. Uh, well, I'm going to shift focus from... Um, the context or the emergence of ISIS. I don't claim to be an expert on ISIS at all. I'm more interested in what ISIS is doing um, to people, particularly um, Iraq. I've been focusing on Iraq both as an academic and an activist, and I should also say I have personal ties to Iraq, so it's very close to my heart. And what I want to do is actually similar to both Yas and Charles. On the one hand, um, look at the specificity of ISIS, how is it different, but at the same time really provide the context and show the continuum, um, particularly with respect to sexualized violence and gender-based violence. And um, so I want to show that, uh, yeah, that we have reached a new stage, really, in terms of sexualized and gender-based violence, particularly in relation to minorities. Uh, but I also want to make the point that um, ISIS has not emerged in a vacuum, but there has been a long history of sexualized and gender-based violence in Iraq, particularly since 2003, but even predating this. So um, you, of course, have seen the pictures of uh, these horrible pictures of beheadings uh, of um, mainly Western journalists, but of course, on a daily basis, um, Iraqi Syrians are being beheaded, and um, I've been particularly following the fate of religious and ethnic minorities in Iraq. Um, you're probably aware that um, Iraq, they're not just Sunni and Shia Iraqis, but there are many, many um, ethnic and religious minorities. Actually, at some point, Iraq was a really vibrant mosaic of ethnic and uh, religious minorities. I mean, in the past, there were lots of Iraqi Jews, but we have Iraqi uh, Christians of different nominations. Um, we have um, uh, Kurds, um, Shabak, Yazidis, uh, Mandaeans, I mean a large uh, range of different uh, groups and many of them actually living historically in the north of Iraq. Um, now, uh, over the last month, really since uh, July particularly, Amnesty International has collected evidence that um, ISIS has launched a campaign of uh, ethnic cleansing and a targeting of religious minorities. And um, I think that you're probably aware of the fate of the Yazidis, or Yazidis as they prefer to be called. Uh, but of course, Christians uh, are also extremely vulnerable. And uh, here, we should say that this hasn't just uh, started in June, but really since 2003, religious and ethnic minorities, particularly religious minorities, have been targeted. And many people actually speak of the end of Christianity uh, in Iraq, which is... Um, you know, extremely uh, sad and, uh, and terrible. And within that, uh, what I'm going to focus on is the specific targeting of women and the use of women's bodies to target and um, 
really uh, violate uh, religious minorities. Now there is a, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not going to give a gender theory lecture here, but uh, we are very much aware that historically and cross-culturally when there is conflict between communities, um, women's bodies are being used to demarcate boundaries between us versus them. So, you know, your women uh, are loose, our women are proper, uh, your women are oppressed, our women are emancipated. And um, policies that, and uh, measures that try to control women's sexuality, that try to control women's dress code, that try to control women's mobility, uh, can be found not just in the context of the Muslim world, but cross-culturally. Now, in Iraq, um, I should say that there is now a, a long history of uh, the control of women's body, sexuality, mobility, and dress codes since 2003, very much in the context of um, sectarian uh, clashes. Um, I think it's very important to recognize that sexualized and gender-based violence actually underwrites much of the broader structural and political violence. And I often get quite unhappy when you know, people speak about <clears throat> authoritarianism, they speak about sectarianism, and then maybe as a footnote they speak about women. But what I'm arguing is actually that um, the targeting of women, and it's not just the targeting of women, but it's also, of course, the construction of certain masculinities, and in the Iraqi context, very much militarized hyper-masculinities, is at the core of uh, dividing communities and trying to control uh, neighborhoods. But I think it's also important analytically to distinguish between different forms of sexualized and gender-based violence. I found the work of Denise Candiotti, she um, is also a member of the source community and she has worked extensively on uh, Afghanistan and how I found her work really instructive. So she said in um, relation to Afghanistan what we see there is the more privatized sexual violence, <clears throat> so that relates in honor-based killings, domestic violence, and so on. And then she speaks about the, the forms of violence that are very much uh, using uh, conflict and sexualized violence as a systemat systematic tool for intimidation. So this is, um, you know, militias, the state using it. And then finally, she spoke about the public performances of Islamic retribution of the Taliban vis-a-vis -vis women. And I see a parallel here in terms of the way we see that sexualized and gender-based violence in Iraq is also divided and that um, what makes some of the violence of ISIS so particularly horrific is that, that they actually try to uh, doctrinally justify it. It's a, it's a performance, it's a, it's a form of, I mean, I totally agree with Charles, we have to be very careful not to take them as face value, but they um, allege to perform uh, an Islamic retribution and they allege that their actions, their forms of violence is doctrinally justified and here they're targeting particularly religious minorities and particularly, of course, people who are not supposedly um, you know, of the book, so not uh, Christians. So um, I'll share with you a statement or parts of the statement um, because I should say that so I'm interested to try to understand analytically what is happening but I'm also as an activist and you know someone who works very closely with Iraqi women's rights activists inside Iraq I'm trying to also ask myself so what is it that we can ask for <clears throat> I think it's a bit too easy for all of us to sit here and say eh, no bombing of Iraq okay but what are we asking for? Um, so on uh, the 23rd of August 2014, the Iraqi Women's Network issued a statement calling on the international community to take action against ISIS. I should say that the Iraqi Women's Network is a network of uh, over 100 women's NGOs cut across Iraq of all ethnic and religious backgrounds. Some are secular, some are more religiously motivated. Since 2004, they have been working together, advocating for women's rights, uh, delivering humanitarian assistance. And they have also been, very importantly, actually at the forefront of challenging sectarianism in Iraq. And uh, some of them have had big trouble because they have clashed regularly 
with uh, former Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki because of his very authoritarian political agenda and he was very much targeting civil society and many of the women's rights activists had lots of problems and were um, some of them actually had to flee because they felt that they might be endangered. So I just um, briefly quote a bit from their statement. We, the Iraqi women who participated in the struggle for dignity, equality, and democracy, launch today our call to the international community and the women of the world to support us to expose and condemn the terror and crimes committed by ISIS. Since the 9th of June, the Iraqi people have been subjected to the most heinous crimes of genocide and ethnic and religious cleansing at the hands of ISIS terrorists. Through the displacement of about one and a half million civilians from the provinces of Nineveh, Salah Adin, Kirkuk, Diyala and Anbar. Most of the victims are Christians, Yazidis, Turkmen and Shabak. Armed groups took many women and girls from those groups to unknown locations. The news are coming from the displaced people from Sinjar, Tal Afar districts, Bashir sub-district, Mosul city, parts of the Ninefe Plain and Amali sub-district about incidents of kidnapping and harassment against women and girls, as well as assaults and practices reminiscent of prehistoric times, such as the sale of women into sexual slavery, murder, threats, robbery, and forcing them to abandon their religions and convert to Islam. This is in addition to the seizure of their houses, looting, and destroying their possessions. The statement is quite long. If you want, I can give you a link. Uh, you can, if you sort of Google the Iraqi Women's Network uh, statement 2014, you'll find it. Um, it also mentions um, 160 women who are currently held in a prison in, in Mosul, subjected to beatings, tortures, and the only way for the women to get out is to get married to one of the ISIS fighters. Um, now, I, don't, I can't go into uh, more detail here, but I should say that at the end of the statement, the Iraqi Women's Network asked the UN, um, particularly the Security Council, but also the international community to act and to take prompt measures to protect women, to provide humanitarian assistance, and then they're also asking to liberate women. Now, ever since I read this, I've been actually struggling because I don't know what it is concretely, being based in London, that I should be asking this government or the international community to liberate women. Of course, I know, I mean, I've worked extensively the last time when we were supposed to liberate women in Iraq, of course, it went, um, it went really, really badly wrong. And I knew that military intervention was not a way to liberate women. But yet, this time, I have to say, you know, as ISIS was outside Erbil, I have family in Baghdad, but I have lots of friends in Erbil who were terrified. Uh, and um, there was sort of the sense that, you know, if nothing happens, that... Um, ISIS was going to uh, march into Erbil, which was, has been, of course, a safe haven for many Syrian refugees, many Iraqi refugees. Uh, at that time, I have to admit, and I know that many people won't like it, but if that day there would have been demonstrations in London, I would not have been able to participate. I mean, that does not translate into um, me asking for military um, intervention. I'm very much aware that bombing ISIS is not going to solve anything. But I also think that we, it's a bit too easy. Uh, we have to think a little bit more carefully and maybe we can have a discussion. But now I wanted to also make sure that we actually contextualize it. And this is clearly without wanting to belittle the unimaginable atrocities committed by ISIS, um, I fear that we still need to make links to, to the broader continuum of gender-based violence. Um, and so my frustration about recent discourses is actually very much rooted in what I uh, see as is a is big uh, hypocrisy. Because since 2003, there has been widespread uh, sexualized and gender-based violence uh, whether it's with respect to uh, trafficking of women, whether it's with respect to forced prostitution, um, forced marriages, honor-based crimes, rapes. Um, and to be honest, neither the Iraqi government nor the international community has really paid much attention. And so um, I think it's very important to, to uh, stress that um, there is 
there is a, is a history of turning a blind eye. And also what I think it's very important to stress, of course, that sexualized violence does not only affect uh, women and girls. Men and boys are also targeted. Um, of course, most visible to everyone, you might remember the images of sexualized violence against the prisoners, male prisoners in Abu Ghraib prison, um, and the shocking images of uh, naked, hooded Iraqi men have, of course, become emblematic of larger human rights abuses and atrocities in the name of democracy and human rights at the hands of the occupation. However, it is not only the American and the British Army that has engaged in the torture and frequent also sexualized violence of, of its prisoners. And here I should say it really cuts across um, Sunni Shia. Uh, there has been um, you know, torture and sexualized violence uh, at the hands of all militias. And I, I really think that uh, you know, we can, uh, that's one way to really challenge sectarianism if you look at perpetrators as well. Um, and of course also men who do not fit in with the ideal of a militarized and heterosexual masculinities, masculinity have been particularly vulnerable since 2003. Uh, gay men, for example, <clears throat> have been increasingly persecuted, attacked, killed, and many were forced to flee Iraq. But even wearing the wrong kind of clothes has been uh, risky. So uh, especially in 2012, there were lots of reports of uh, targeted attacks against um, mainly young men identified as emos. And um, so there was a sort of wave of killing. And these various forms of violence really have been working to reconfigure masculinities and femininities in, in the post-invasion context. But I, I would argue that they have also been employed actively as a tool um, for new forms of militarized and authoritarian politics. And um, I know I'm running out of time, but uh, the, the ritualized and performative um, sort of violence of ISIS um, reminds me, I mean, early on when the different militias actually moved into neighborhoods. Uh, the first thing that either a Sunni or Shia neighborhood did was to um, hand out leaflets commenting about women's dress codes, women supposed to wear uh, Islamic dress, whatever that might mean, because I mean, it's not that uh, in Iraq women were running around with shorts or miniskirts beforehand. Um, but it was very clear that from the very beginning, from 2003, uh, you know, women were used as markers of control of territory. Um, but with ISIS now, it's taken on a very uh, different dimension. And I um, think it is very important to think more carefully what it is that we can ask for, we can ask for uh, that might help uh, women in Iraq without falling into the let's liberate women as we did so badly and of course never uh, were going to in either Afghanistan or Iraq. Thank you. <laughs>